Um, hi, everybody. Uh, firstly, um, oh, no, no, that's too fancy for me. I've got, I've got my buttons on my laptop. Um, firstly, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is obviously my first Thinking Digital conference, and it's been brilliant. Um, secondly, I just want to apologize for my voice. I know I sound like an adolescent schoolboy, but I'm getting like, over a cold, so if my voice cracks, you know, bear with me. Um, but yeah, uh, about me, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm obviously, you can hear it, I'm originally from the US. Um, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, but I've lived in London for the past 12 years. So I originally moved to London for the club scene and I stayed to marry an Englishman, so that's why I'm still here. Um, and I've only ever worked as a designer in the UK. Um, like, I've never worked in America. And I've been self-employed for the past four and a half years now, and I'm a designer who works with data. And I say that I work in these three spaces. So um, just to kind of give you a brief run-through of the type of work that I've done in those past years, um, it includes things like designing a scroll wheel for the visual index of the app, my Fry, the app version of Stephen Fry's second autobiography, um, where you're able to use this visualization of the themes within the text to explore and read through the text in a nonlinear way, to um, a more recent project, creating a visualization of Wi-Fi signals heard real time through hearing aids during walks around London for an art commission by Frank Swain and Dan Jones, to uh, using data in a different way uh, creating work for an exhibition at the v a a couple years ago called Memory Palace, where by mixing processes of data gathering and visualization with traditional illustration, I created prints illustrating a story uh, by the writer Harry Kunzru. So creating all these illustrations through visualizing data or manipulating the data for aesthetic reasons or drawing data by hand. And so, I mean, those are three sort of different projects. Um, you know, and I walk, I obviously work across a really wide spectrum with data, but I think like four and a half years in, the one thing that I do know is that I've reached the point in my career where I'm becoming post something. And so I really love like how people attach post in front of everything because it makes you seem super cutting edge. Like there isn't even a word for your at yet. So in the spirit of this, in the spirit of post, being postmodern, being post digital, or like, I, this is my favorite, being post dubstep. I saw it in like a magazine. I am a post-infographic. And now, the thing is, is that I'm pro, so pro, like well done, well thought out, rigorous information design, but like I'm just post these types of graphics that you find all over the internet. And um, my reason for being post-infographic, I've got three, are as follows. Um, the first is that many of the infographics that you see, they're not really information graphics, but they're digital posters. So they're just facts neatly laid out in an eye-catching design. And these are imposters in this scene, like, they're imposters. And uh, the data visualization studio Periscopic has a blog post about this, where they describe the difference and they say that, like, for a digital poster, extremely large numbers surrounded by nicely formed text, that's not an information graphic. Rather, information or data visualization is it expands the essence of data using context and metaphor, allowing the user to gain a deeper understanding. So that's where I work. I don't work in that. And um, really, it's like there's a difference between a digital poster being one-dimensional and data visualization or an information like a proper information graphic being multi-dimensional. And so these digital posters have diluted the whole landscape, and we have this infographic overload. I'm sure you guys are probably tired of looking at them as well. And I mean, because on Google, like miles and miles of column infographics, as digital posters as far as the eye can see. And they all look exactly the same. And so as a designer, like, how can this be an impactful, memorable way of communicating a concept if everyone is making something that looks like your design? So my third reason uh, that I'm post-infographic is just that I'm bored. I'm just... I'm, I'm bored of working in that space, or have been, like I don't really do that anymore. And, and so I have a designer's infographic fatigue. Like I'm just tired of only making things like that uh, with data. Um, and as a designer who wants to, like, I'm pro proper information design, but post, like, post infographic. Anyway, as a designer who wants to keep solving new design problems, these projects, like in that format, feel really restrictive and structured, and they don't really offer a lot of scope for creativity or innovation. So I feel for me, at least, and I think probably for a lot of other people, we've reached the des like a design dead end. We've reached the end of the road there. And 
I think that I should be thankful for this fatigue that happened to me because this fatigue uh, helped me expand how I work with data. And so for many of my projects, I call myself a data illustrator. Sometimes I say artist, but I like I was telling Seb, I try not to say artist because I think illustrator makes me seem hireable. Like, <laughs> so like hire me, yes, I, I'm commercial. Um, I often visualize data in order to communicate subjective and emotional like messages about a subject. So um, data illustration, it falls kind of in, in this in-between space between, quote, well, like, objective data visualization, that's a loaded term, and then subjective communication design. So I really like working here, and I like finding ways of ensuring that data maintains its integrity while also using it to communicate in this more emotive way. And so this is a space where I like to work create creatively with data, and I'll show you what I'm thinking about in some of my explorations and how they've led into this uh, one personal project that I'm working on. Um, but just to begin, as a little bit of background, um, I uh, come from a print background. I don't really code, and I often do much of my data gathering by hand or my data uh, rendering by hand in like an Adobe program. And so I am learning how to code, but very, 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 very slowly due to a project taking up a lot of my time at the moment. I keep being drawn back to this handmade process. And I think upon closer reflection, it's because I gather data by hand because I like this physical nature of this process and its effect upon the body and upon one's life. And so for me, I often see this idea of like, you know, when you engage with data by hand or you do anything that's very time consuming and laborious, um, the, like, like data gathering and visualization becomes a type of endurance test. And I like this, these difficult endurance test type of projects. And so you can see it in some of my own work like uh, when I took the longest sentence in James Joyce's Ulysses, so that, that, that's the whole sentence, and it's over 4,000 words long, and it's from Molly Bloom's soliloquy, and it's like incredibly you know, difficult to com like, understand anyway. And I use traditional pencil-based sentence diagramming techniques that I was taught in school, and some people from the US might have learned this as well. And uh, parse and assess the whole sentence by hand in order to visualize the grammar structure of the sentence. So it's all handmade and all human assessment and no machines. And uh, that's what it looks like close up. And so for me, it's one of the most taxing mental projects I've ever had to complete. It's this feat of endurance where this intensive data gathering became this mountain to climb. Like my world for that month was shaped around this data. It affected my actions, life, and interactions with people. Um, during that time. And so these pieces of paper I have in my studio are a souvenir of this endurance test. And so I'm interested in like these projects where data gathering uh, changes your behavior and it, it almost becomes a performance of sorts. And where like the, I like this performative aspect of analog data gathering and visualization and it's influenced recent projects where I explore using physical movement as a way for people to engage with a data set. So creating spaces where people can move through data. And the first uh, place that I did that was uh, almost two years ago, it was at Facebook. So I spent uh, a couple months at, in their Menlo pa Park campus as their first data artist in residence. Um, so my task was to create artwork for the campus, which looks like this, so lots of murals and posters and concrete floors. It's very art college-y um, until you see the engineers around the corner. But um, yeah, so I had to create artwork, and I could use any anonymous data that I wanted, but that, I'm not really interested in big data as much as personal data or small data. And probably because it, like, I was spending two months away from my husband, so for my work I was looking at re yeah, relationships and I decided to translate couples' digital performances of their relationship on Facebook, like how they uh, you know, say I love you on walls and like, interact with each other in front of their friends. Turn that into something physical by making dance step diagrams from their interaction data. So yeah, so you could perform their interactions in a real real space. And so I first, I started the project by stalking my husband and my friend's relationships, and then I opened it up to the wider Facebook community, and loads of strangers said, yes, you can, you can look at our relationships and stalk us. And so I began to gather data on their interactions and create, uh, this is just a selection, a series of interim visualizations of uh, interactions for a month 
And so it's uh, pink and blue, but that's not based on gender, just because I like pink and blue. But each one uh, represents a couple, where each side is one person's timeline. And then it's in chronological order from top to bottom, where um, if they're, they're either on each other's timelines or they can be tagged together in a post or moving back and forth. And so these movements I wanted to use in my, my dance steps. And uh, to communicate this and speak, I decided to use just to visualize it, dance step notation that we all know. So I'm speaking in a language that people can understand. And using these interim visualizations by just turning them over and using them as a template to create these no dance step notations. And so I did it originally for four couples. I mean, it's quite complex. Again, this is all like figuring it out by hand. And I'm not a choreographer. It's more of a walk than a dance. But um, it's all notated. Um, with the, the interactions that are happening. This is the only user testing I've ever done in my life, was like have people test my notations, and I finally, so like the whole thing is set to an eight-step count, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you cycle through, and that's how you dance through these dances, um, how you stay in time. And so this is the finished piece, well, two finished pieces, and saw it on the floor. And so here, uh, any passerby have the opportunity to move through this data and feel how it dictates how their body moves and shifts across the diagram. And so my husband, he's there. He came out at the end, and we did a dance, and I can I tell you about it. So we're on timelines, and he's like posting on my timeline, and then we're tagged together in a post. And then I'm on uh, my own timeline, we're tagged together in a post. And I'm posting, it's all chronological, so I'm posting, He's not, and then he like, likes or comments it. And then he goes over to his timeline, and then I like or comment. And then we're, like, we're posting uh, at the same time on uh, sep separate timelines. And then he posts, I comment or like, I post, he comments or likes. He posts, I comment or like, I post, um, he comments or likes. He posts, I comment or like, that's all real data. Um, and uh, yeah, he's back over on my timeline, and then we're over on his timeline, and uh, I'm liking or commenting, and then we're tagged together in a post, and then I comment, and then, uh, yeah. So it's not actually my data, it's like a, it's an employee couple's data, but. Um, and then uh, this project, uh, led on to another project that I did at the South Bank Center in November. I was part of the Web We Want Festival to commemorate 25 years of the web, and so I was asked to create another movement-based piece like the Facebook project to be placed in the Royal Festival Hall to make data approachable and accessible to passers-by, so kids to adults. So I chose to focus on communicating the basic premises of open data. Since, it, you know, the open, you know, Tim Berners-Lee is now running the Open Data Institute. So um, I decided to create an open data playground um, because play makes sense with open data. You know, da open data sets are published online and anyone can play with them and use them and interact with them. So I made these floor-based games uh, from open data sets where people could play with an open data set, again, in a physical space. And um, I used Hopscotch as my main movement reference because it's an intuitive game. You know how to play when you see it. And I selected three open data sets and encoded movement left and right um, and did the distance between double foot movements with this data. So uh, the open data sets used for these basic patterns uh, is uh, the cap cabinet office spending and types of spending over 500 quid, London ozone readings, and highs and lows taken from Heathrow Airport. And... Um, so this is what the final like, rendering of these games look like. So they, ha they like, allude to that ge those geometric aesthetic that you see on those playground games. And um, if you look at them close up, uh, you can see like, along the side the actual data is still listed on the game. And then there's a legend saying uh, what the data is. So it's always accessible. You, you know, if people can read it if they choose. And uh, yeah, so we decided to install two of them. They were two meters by 12 long. And it went down a treat with the under fives, you know, everything there is to know about open data. Uh, and their parents who were able to read, like, you know, who were looking and reading the data details. So it functioned on two levels. And uh, what I really like about this is that, is this, just through, like, the interactions with it, it illustrates this concept behind 
open data in that everyone who was playing with it were all uh, interacting in like, <laughs> however they chose. They, you know, and that was all right. They could do what they wanted with that data. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of dancers in the space. He was just showing off. Um, and then to start a tradition, here's my husband and I again, hopping through this diagram as well, though we're like a little tipsier. So, um, so it's just, I, like, I like it, it just shows that like, the different data sets are creating different patterns of movement and you can feel the difference when you're working with it. Uh, now that leads on like this physical, I'm interested in physical because I've always been a print designer, so I like these physical space sort of things. And, um, it's led to experiments with communicating data sets through physical objects for a commission titled Air Transform that I just finished in January. Um, and so this is a project that I collaborated, collaborated on with my friend Miriam Quick, who is the data researcher on the project. And it was commissioned by the Better, data, Better With Data Society in Sheffield. Um, they asked three sets of artists to use open Sheffield air quality data to inspire publish, public engagement with the issue of air pollution. And so since air pollution is relatively invisible and then the damage that it does to our body is quite subtle, um, these are the questions we ask ourselves. And so we decided to make these physical data objects that you could wear and touch and experience in order to communicate this data in a more memorable way. So memorable is the operative term. And we really wanted to create something that would be friendly and approachable for Sheffield citizens who might not care about air quality data or just not care about data. So we created two sets of objects. The first was a series of necklaces where um, each necklace represented a week's worth of data from sensors uh, measuring uh, large particulate levels. And, and we, we put, used necklaces because uh, the particulate matter damages your heart and lungs, so it made sense to put it there. And so these just highlight particularly interesting weeks of data um, in 2014 in Sheffield. And so like each segment, each bit of plastic represents six hours. And so the lower the, um, it goes from low levels, which are small and rounded, to like high levels, which are large and pointy. So the, you know, they're, they're spikier to the touch, the more um, particulates are in the air. And so you read it, like if you wear it, and it, it reads from left to right on the, the wear, and if you run your hands over it, you can literally feel the air quality in Sheffield and how it goes up and down. And so this is a week of smog. It's particularly like thick and chunky with like high levels of particulates in the air. Um, this is bonfire uh, week. So the highest levels for the year is the sharp shard, the really pointy shard of bonfire night. And then a particularly low level uh, for uh, the week of Christmas and New Year. So that was one of the lower weeks of the year. Um, another part of this project, uh, we were looking at think, um, thinking about how pollution affects visibility, you know, it creates a haze in the sky. And so we decided to work with this to communicate data and create these glasses where each represents a, a levels of pollution on a, a, a single day in Sheffield in 2014, where um, they, yeah, they have a pattern etched onto the lenses, so there's three lenses in front of each other. And each one represents different uh, pollutants. So higher levels of pollutant are indicated by a larger pattern on the lens. And what this does is it clouds the wearer's vision, so it's alluding to those hazy views caused by the pollutants. So when you put on a high pollution day, you get like a foggier view through the glasses. So it's a very subtle way of communicating data. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know how to seg from this to my last bit, so I'll just change the slide. <laughs> so uh, yeah, those are a lot of the projects I've done. And all of these themes and explorations I've touched upon in earlier works have been brought together in my final project, which is a personal project. So yeah, data as endurance test, a performance, a souvenir, and a physical experience um, all comes together in Dear Data. Um, and this project is currently ongoing. And it's not just my project. I'm only half of the project. It's uh, something that I'm working on with Georgia Lupi, a very talented co uh, information designer who is the co-founder and design director at Accurat, which is a design studio based in Milan and New York. And so we first met a year, well, we've only met three times, but a year ago we decided we wanted to collaborate on a project together. And there are quite a few parallels between our lives we found out, but the main one is that we both uh, come from this analog approach when it comes 
like this pencil-based, handmade starting point in regards to data visualization, which is, again, a rarity within our community. And so we decided we wanted to get to know each other better, but we lived in different uh, countries and continents. And uh, since data visualization is a language that we speak every day for work, we decided to use this process as our mode of communication. So, um, yeah, we started this year-long drawing project last September, and every week, here's what we do. Um, we agree to gather data on a set theme, and then we gather that data in whichever way we prefer. And then we use this data, we like visualize it in a drawing on a postcard. So that's Georgia in New York, and that's me in London. And, um, and then we drop the postcard in our mailbox or post box. And then we just wait with our fingers crossed, because the posts, like, they often don't arrive, which is annoying. And, uh, yeah, eventually, though, you know, the postcard should arrive at the other person's address with all the scuff marks of its journey over the ocean. So it's kind of like a very slow data transmission. <laughs> and so this is just the fronts of some of the postcards so far. So that's Georgia's are on that side, and mine are always on the right. And so the, uh, just close-ups. Um, so we have to, like, do this every week. It probably takes, like, the whole thing probably takes, like, eight hours of time a week. It's kind of... An, saying, maybe because I'm not very good at drawing, but these are some of mine, and these are Georgia's, and we're visualizing data by hand, and it's a very physical process where the data drawing is always shown on the front of the postcard, and then this is Georgia's. Uh, like, recently we did a week of, like, tracking every time we move through a door or a different space. Um, and so, like, on the back, it's always how, how to read it. And so you just flip back and forth. It's a very physical process of trying to understand the data. Um, and like the reason we're doing this is we like this sm slow manual approach because we like yeah we like this analog approach as a contrast to the often discussed in this conference mechanical and personal data gathering that takes place on a massive scale across like every sphere of our existence and um, we like a lot of the data gathering that we do is very labor intensive because we often have to do it very manually and we. It, we can't use standard metrics derived from technological devices to record, like, to get this data. Um, so it can only be done by hand. But we like this because we see this uh, manual capture as a way of helping us notice more closely our lives as, as they're happening around us. So this act of noticing and noting is something that is an important part of the project. And really, like, for our project, each postcard is a souvenir of our week that we're sending to the other. An exploration of small, incomplete data made very human and personal due to uh, its inherent imperfections. So, and even the choices in like, the data collection that we, we do every week, it functions as a unique representation of each person. So uh, we have a wide range of themes um, from the mundane to the more uh, depressing, like envy. Uh, but like our first card was we tracked every time we checked a clock to see the time. So we're looking for like, you know, normally overlooked textures of data in our lives or just a week of physical contact or to learn more about each other, a week of wardrobes or like I said, envy or this week I'm tracking um, pessimism, which is actually really depressing because <laughs> I'm really pessimistic. But um, you can find this project online uh, up there and new postcard deliveries are on Wednesday. So we're posting them a little later than we receive them. And we're currently in week 37. And I think it, it, this is an example of a self-initiated project that somehow, because there are two of us, we've managed to sustain. I think we don't know each other well enough that we can just abandon it. But we, we yeah, so we, we hold each other accountable in that um, kind of having to, to look, to do our best for the other. Um, and I think, like, for all of this uh, work that I've shown you, and in regards, like, thinking about this idea of being post-infographic. I just think, at the end of the day, information design and, and, and maybe more uh, accessible or layperson data visualization is just design. So instead of keeping it siloed off from the rest of, like, the design world, I think we need to approach these with, like, the open approach and mindset that we do any other design project. And that's it. So thank you.